Washington. Coming up next, live coverage of a hearing looking at scientific fraud and misconduct. The forum is a hearing of the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Intergovernmental Relations and Human Resources under the chairmanship of New York Congressman Ted Weiss. The hearing has already begun. We join the proceedings in progress. Other cases are still not resolved. Sometimes the health and quality of life of thousands of people depend on uncovering scientific misconduct as quickly as possible. For example, in one of the cases we will hear about today, retarded children receive potentially dangerous and ineffective drug treatment because a respected scientist claimed that several widely used drugs lowered IQ scores and that other drugs were safer and more effective. Last year, it was revealed that the scientists' claims were based on studies that had never been conducted. In fact, this respected scientist had just made up the data, which were then published in scientific magazines and discussed in speeches across the country. Scientific fraud and misinformation can also cost the federal government millions of dollars. If a scientist publishes facts that are not true, other scientists may waste their time and federal funding on studies that are based on those erroneous research results. In other instances, the federal government may continue to fund the research efforts of a scientist who is making up his or her data. A major focus of today's hearing is to find out what the Department of Health and Human Services is doing to prevent and investigate scientific misinformation. This is a complicated issue with no easy answers. However, our initial review suggests that HHS does little to facilitate the timely and appropriate resolution of these cases. As a general rule, HHS expects universities to investigate these cases on their own and only steps in if the universities are found to be negligent in their actions. We must not let the few publicized cases of scientific fraud and misconduct undermine our belief in the integrity of science or the federal commitment to scientific research. On the other hand, we need to know whether these are isolated cases and whether the federal government, in conjunction with the scientific research community, needs to do more to protect the public and the scientific community from scientific misinformation. And so the purpose of today's hearing is to answer the following questions. One, how prevalent are scientific fraud, misconduct, and inaccuracies? Two, are the universities, medical schools, and research institutes effective in preventing and investigating fraud? And three, how does HHS respond to allegations of fraud, misconduct, and inaccuracies, and should they do more to prevent, investigate, and resolve these cases? At today's hearing, we have an impressive list of witnesses from HHS and from the academic community. These include scientists who have made allegations of fraud, misconduct, or inaccuracies. Scientists who have studied the dynamics involved in investigating and reporting fraud. And the NIH and NIMH staff who are responsible for resolving these cases. As is the custom of the Government Operations Committee, all witnesses before the committee will be sworn in. From time to time during the hearing, we'll be inserting into the record, without objection, documents relevant to this matter. Before we begin, let me say to all of our witnesses that the full text of your written statements will be inserted in the hearing record. Because of the long list of witnesses today, we have asked you all to summarize your testimony so that there will be time for questions after each panel presentation. Let me now welcome our first panel of witnesses and ask you to take your places behind your uh, name tags at the witness table. Dr. Robert Sprague, professor at the Institute for Research on Human Development at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Dr. Jerome Jacobstein, director of nuclear medicine at Graduate Hospital in Philadelphia. And Dr. June Price Tangney, a psychologist on the fa faculty at Bryn Mawr College. Now, Will you raise your right hands, each of you, and you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. 
letting the record indicate that each of the witnesses has responded in the affirmative. I want to thank all of you for taking time from your very busy schedules to be with us today. And also, I have a proclivity for mispronouncing names, as mine is often mispronounced, so that if I've done that in your cases, please take the occasion to correct my pronunciation. Right? Um, we'll ask each of you to testify first, and then we'll have questions when all of you have completed your testimony. Dr. Spray. Dr. Sprague, I think that we'll begin with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you indicated, I'm a professor at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. That microphone is voice activated, which means that you really have to bring it closer to you, I think, to uh, get it to start. Is this better? Is this better now? Yes, that's All better. Right. right. Thank you. As uh, you indicated, I'm a professor at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. For the past 24 years that I've been on the faculty at the University of Illinois, my research interest has been in the area of psychopharmacology, which is the study of medications to give them because of their effect on the behavior of people. Most of this research has involved study of hyperactive children, now called attention deficit disorder, and mentally retarded individuals, most of whom are residing in state institutions. Much of my research has been supported by NIMH, that's the National Institute of Mental Health, for the past 18 years, although I have also been supported by NICHD, that's the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. I now have a one-year grant from NIMH, and I'm co-investigator with my colleague at the University of Illinois, Professor Carl Newell, on a three-year grant from NICHD. Both of these grants involve the psychotropic medication side effect of tardive dyskinesia, which is an abnormal involuntary movement disorder associated with long-term use of tranquilizing medication. I've served as a consultant to many federal agencies, including two terms on the study section of NIMH, FDA, Department of Justice, and I'm currently on a study section for NICHD. I believe I have a good understanding of how grant applications are reviewed by both NICHD and NIMH and how grant applications are approved for funding. My testimony today will involve my discovering and reporting to NIMH a case of scientific fraud in December 1983 and the glacier-like pace of the NIMH response to those allegations. Also, I will discuss the role of a whistleblower in scientific fraud as I experienced, experienced it and the role and the reaction of NIMH to me. And with that, I'll just briefly highlight uh, some of the documentation I have uh, submitted uh, and for saving of time. I'd also point out that at the time this occurred, I was a researcher, had been for a number of years in this area, and I think reasonably well known, and obviously a professor was tenure at the University of Illinois. I mention that not for myself, but to point out that I had great difficulty uh, getting a, a hearing on this, and it, I think, has tremendous implications for a junior person in a laboratory that doesn't have the protections that I have. With that, I point out that in uh, my letter three, that this is the letter of December 20th, 1983, that I sent to NIMH. It's a six-page letter. It had 43-page appendix, and I can assure you, I usually don't write those kind of letters. Uh, but I did have a table of facts on that concerning Stephen E. Bruning, who was a person I was uh, alleging that committed scientific fraud. And again, for summary, I pointed out that in his progress report to NIMH, he claimed to have run about 273 session, experimental sessions in uh, study days in, in a year's time when there was 261 working days. Now, that's rare. That's more than 100% efficiency. I've never encountered this in the laboratory. I don't think anyone else has. And it should be uh, very clear grounds for at least uh, considering that there may be problems there. Then I point out in letter four, which is a letter by Mrs. Lorraine Torres to Dr. Thomas Dietrich, who was a associate senior vice president at University of Pittsburgh, that she included uh, verbatim my table one, pointing out some of the same things. Now, 
I don't think there's any doubt at that point the University of Pittsburgh had information that there were serious problems possibly with uh, Stephen Bruning's work. But nevertheless, that in the charges to the investigative committees at the University of Pittsburgh, that's letters five and six, uh, this aspect was ignored. In fact, those committees did not look at that point at any of his work at the University of Pittsburgh. They focused completely on the work prior to that, which was the Coldwater Regional Center in Coldwater, Michigan, where he worked prior to going to the University of Pittsburgh. Coldwater, of course, is a state facility for the mentally retarded. And then probably the most astounding thing of all was reported by one of the University of Pittsburgh committees on February 17th, 1984. That's letter seven in my documentation. This is a letter from the doctors Adler, Michaels, and Lee to uh, Dr. Leon, who is dean of the School of Medicine. And I will read. Dr. Bruning admitted to us that statements in the abstract were false. So Dr. Bruning admitted to that uh, faculty committee that there were falsification in the abstract. Seems to me that's a confession, and it's amazing that that's mentioned nowhere else in hundreds of pages and thousands of pages of documentation. That was totally ignored. And I pointed that out in my final letter to NIMH in um, February of 1987. I, I'll read briefly their response to that. But in the meantime, things continued on with uh, investigation. And finally, Dr. Leon, again the dean of the medical school, wrote to Mrs. Torres July 6, 1984, that's letter 11, and I will read one sentence. Briefly stated, our hearing board can find no serious fault with Dr. Bruning's activities here in Pittsburgh. And one other sentence, I have no grounds to take action against him. Uh, so by not investigating the problems that were outlined to them, and by not taking any cognizance of his confession, then that kind of a letter can be written. And of course, problems then compounded from that point. Um, in August of 23, 1984, and that's my letter 12, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health did appoint an investigator, uh, Mr. Shriver. The first person he investigated was me, which was a little surprising to me. And I wrote a letter to him, which was letter 13 on December 6, 1984, it's a lengthy letter. I point out that I gave him a lot of documentation, uh, 51 documents at that time, and uh, I ask about this statement that, it, that the University of Pittsburgh had no grounds to take activity against uh, Stephen Bruning. That letter was never answered. Then in uh, February 15th, 1985, uh, and that's letter 14, uh, NIMH appointed an investigative panel and uh, I met with that panel on April 19th in New York City and subsequently wrote a letter to the chairman, Dr. Arnold Friedhoff, on April 25th, 1985, and that's letter 16, uh, again outlining some of the same things, at least my concerns about the children that participated in the studies at the University of Pittsburgh and about the length of time it was taking the investigation that letter was never answered, never acknowledged being received, never never answered. During this time, uh, Stephen Bruning was still out consulting and speaking, and I sent a letter to the person at NIMH that was then responsible for the investigation, doc, uh, uh, Dr. Wright Williamson. That was in June 6, 1986, and that's letter 17 in the documentation, pointing out that on April 3 and April 4, 1986, Stephen Bruning spoke in uh, Michigan on the topic of <clears throat> considerations for the Behavior Management Committee review of a complex case, medication for behavior control and restrictive behavior management, to behavioral control committees, which are the most sensitive committees in these institutions. In fact, they review the most difficult cases, and those difficult cases usually involve uh, restrictive behavior modification and or medication. And it's very difficult. I sat on such a committee and sometimes there's simply no answers to those problems. Nevertheless, Bruning was, under, after all these allegations, still free to go out and speak to, to those committees on a very, very sensitive topic. And then I point out in letter 18, I uh, did some summary and indicated that uh, during a, 
basically a five-year period from 1979. Subsequently, Bruning accounted for one-third of their literature in this area, which is simply amazing that any one scientist could account for that much uh, um, literature. Finally, uh, well, a couple of other letters on February 9th, 1987, that's my letter 19. I responded to NIMH draft publication, uh, several things. The only thing I will mention, I put a table in there indicating the agenda or the um, schedule of events since there was nothing in the lengthy documentation in this big black notebook said anything about the length of time it took. So I put a letter in there indicating that up until the draft report, it took three years and 23 days. And the points are outlined of the various uh, events taking those three years. And I point out, in spite of a confession from him, and I think uh, that I gave them incontrovertible evidence that there was falsification, nevertheless, it took that long length of time. Um, finally, I uh, point out that the University of Pittsburgh publication issued in June 11, 1987, and that's report 22, um, it was stated, and I'll simply read one sentence, Health Sciences Senior Vice President Detry told Senate Council Monday, quote, what we are faulted for, quote, unquote, is that we didn't further investigate Bruning's research at Pittsburgh. We did not feel the investigation was warranted. And if I may, I just want to read uh, just one brief report about the NIMH attitude as reported to a reporter. Uh, and this is in Science and Government Report of April 1, 1987. A similar but elaborate response to the same question was provided by Lorraine Torres, director of the NIMH Division of External Activities, where Sprague's grants was administered. The question involved the ethics of, of letting the institution, institution, the parents, and everyone else know about the problems with his work. The question posed was, wouldn't it be ethical to advise the institution of the panel's conclusions with appropriate stress on the distance still to be traveled in the review process? Answer, no it wouldn't, Torrey said, adding that concerns about inappropriate medications based upon Bruning's research were misguided. There's quote, there's a considerable distance between an initial report and medication prescribing, unquote, she said. Tories remained adamant that NIMH has no responsibility to alert anyone to the panel's finding at this time. And that's all of that paragraph. And I end my testimony here, and, and of course we'll answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Sprague. Dr. Jacobstein. Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Jerome Jacob Stein. I am the physician director of nuclear medicine at the Graduate Hospital in Philadelphia and clinical associate professor of radiology at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. I was involved in a case of scientific misconduct that lasted from October 1981 to September 1987. The experiences I gained from those six traumatic years have, I believe, given me valuable insight into some very serious problems in this area that I would like to share with this committee. In October 1981, it came to my attention that Dr. Jeffrey Bohr, a cardiologist at the New York Hospital and a faculty member at Cornell University Medical College, was attempting to induce a medical student to make multiple misrepresentations in a manuscript describing a scientific study that we were working on together. Thus began a six-year odyssey that pitted me against not only Dr. Bohr, but several of his colleagues and co-authors, Cornell University Medical College, Cornell University, and the NIH, all of whom showed a reluctance or inability to deal with this issue properly. My concerns were first brought to the attention of the dean of the medical college, who chose a committee to look into my charges. From what I have been able to learn about the conduct and procedures of that committee, I can only conclude that its investigation in December 1981 had not been and had never been meant to be anything but a cover-up. The reasons for that conclusion are described in my prepared statement. Following that experience, 
I and my attorney took our case to Cornell University, but the university showed no interest in a serious investigation. So after about six months of effort, we gave up and went to the NIH, which did agree to investigate our charges. However, the NIH investigation was a failure from every point of view. The initial investigation conducted at the medical school was so inept as to defy rational explanation. The most inexperienced investigator should have known that you don't ask the foxes if they have dined on the chickens, at least not without checking their teeth for feathers. And yet that is precisely what happened. The NIH investigator spoke to Dr. Bohr and two or three of his co-authors, asking these individuals whether my allegations were correct. And being solemnly assured that they were not, he dutifully packed up and returned home. He did not interview knowledgeable but uninvolved third parties, did not interview laboratory personnel or review laboratory procedures, and did not look at the data books. Nor did the NIH investigator ask me if I could explain the contradictions in testimony. We received his initial draft report in March 1983, which, was, which essentially exonerated Dr. Bohr and his colleagues. In spite of these initial findings, we were optimistic. The draft report was so obviously flawed, so remiss in not having checked out statements and claims against the data books and other sources of written evidence, so internally inconsistent and so replete with conclusions diametrically opposed to the evidence that we felt confident that we would have little difficulty in getting it revised. In fact, it took four and one half more years before the NIH finally, belatedly, and obviously quite reluctantly reversed their position and found that in fact many of our charges were correct. Even so, they resisted drawing the obvious conclusions. There is, it would seem, a remarkable reticence on the part of the NIH, apparently pervasive throughout the institution, to find fault with individuals guilty of research misconduct, except in the most extreme and blatant situations, such as the wholesale fabrication of data. In each instance in the Bohr Cornell case, the individuals were held responsible for far less than the evidence justified. Considering that the so-called errors in the manuscript were brought to the attention of Dr. Bohr and at least some of his co-authors long before publication of the material, that they presumably reviewed the evidence before defending themselves against the charges, and that they chose nonetheless to go ahead and publish these so-called errors anyway, the NIH's refusal to term the misconduct intentional and refusal to even name the co-authors is an affront to honest scientists everywhere. Furthermore, the NIH, in ignoring the co-authors' culpability, is sending precisely the wrong message at a time when there is a great need to increase, not decrease, the responsibility of co-authors for the content, contents of a manuscript. The NIH's reluctance to hold its research institutions responsible for their behavior is an even more serious problem. Its refusal to consider the role of the medical school or the university in a possible cover-up was explicit from the very beginning of the investigation. And the final report did not even mention that the medical college had fed false information to the NIH during the course of the investigation. The ability and willingness of research institutions to police themselves also deserves comment. Of all NIH policies in regard to scientific misconduct and research fraud, none is more naive, more irresponsible, or more out of touch with reality than their plan to turn primary responsibility for the prevention, detection, management, and correction of research fraud over to the research institutions themselves. To assign these institutions that responsibility without a formidable and credible oversight mechanism is simply begging for abuse. The NIH has shown itself incapable of providing that oversight. The reasons for my skepticism about the research institution's ability to police themselves are detailed in my prepared statement. The problem of scientific misconduct will not go away by itself, but it will not be difficult to solve once we have the collective will to do so. The problem is only to develop that will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacob Stein. Dr. Tangney? 
Mr. Chairman, I am June Price Tangney, a lecturer in human development at Bryn Mawr College. I'm also a clinical psychologist and member of the American Psychological Association, a professional and scientific association which has developed model principles governing the ethical conduct of psychologists. I'm here to present some results from my survey of researchers' attitudes towards scientific fraud. My primary concern today is with what I'll call the observant scientist, the researcher who inadvertently stumbles across facts that lead him or her to suspect a colleague of serious misconduct. There's a widely held belief that the rare case of scientific fraud will be promptly discovered by a failure to replicate. That is, that the scientific process has built in a self-corrective process whereby scientists attempt to repeat or replicate critical findings. But according to a 1982 book entitled Betrayers of the Truth, most major incidents of scientific fraud have been uncovered not by another laboratory's failure to replicate, but rather by a colleague's or an assistant's suspicions, suspicions that were followed up by pointed inquiry and investigation. Experience since 1982 has not pr proved otherwise. This experience suggests that one of the more powerful agents of self-correction in science lies in the social context of science, that is, with the individual scientists who observe a potential incident of misconduct. How likely is it that observant scientists will take action? Several years ago, I conducted a multidisciplinary uh, survey study to assess scientists' attitudes towards and perceptions of scientific fraud. I'd like to emphasize that the study was not designed to assess the prevalence of scientific fraud. In fact, it would be inappropriate to draw any conclusions from my survey about the frequency of scientific misconduct. But several of the study's key findings concern the likely response of observant scientists who notice serious errors or misconduct. I'll briefly describe some of the results of my study and then I'll briefly mention what I think are the potential policy implications of these findings. Participants in my study were scientific researchers at a single large American university, generally regarded as one of the nation's leading research institutions. Of the 1,100 anonymous questionnaires that were distributed uh, to the faculty and research staff, 245 were completed and returned. So this modest response rate sets some limits on the generalizability of the findings that I'll be reporting today. To put the study's key findings in context, let me first briefly summarize researchers' general perceptions of scientific fraud. Most scientists, that is more than 80%, indicated that they believe that scientific fraud is not very widespread in their field. And here I focused on the most clear-cut types of misconduct, uh, falsified data, and plagiarism. But half of the scientists believe that when such offenses do occur, they're not likely to be discovered. These were scientists' general perceptions. I then asked researchers about their own personal experiences. 32% of the scientists reported that they had at some time suspected a colleague in their field of falsifying data. Although this finding suggests that scientific fraud is a problem worthy of concern and attention, I want to emphasize that it doesn't indicate how many researchers actually have engaged in scientific misconduct. It's entirely possible, indeed likely, that several researchers had the same individual in mind. It's also likely that researchers who've personally struggled with the issue of scientific fraud were more likely to return the questionnaires. Moreover, this was a question about suspicions of misconduct. It's likely that many of these suspicions were unfounded. A more important, more interpretable, interpretable and perhaps more disturbing finding is that of those who had suspected falsification of data, 54% took no action to verify their suspicions or to remedy the situation. Similarly, 32% of researchers had suspected a colleague of plagiarism, but over half of these scientists took no action. Now these results raise some serious concerns about the effectiveness of self-correction in science. Although experience has shown that the observant scientist plays a key role in self-correction, the data here suggests that these individuals are often quite reluctant to take action when faced with suspicions of scientific fraud. In another section of the survey, I presented researchers with two hypothetical situations involving their own laboratory. Scientists were asked what they would do 
if they discovered a year after publishing that a part of their publication was based on false data, for example, doctored by an assistant, although they still intuitively believed the published conclusions to be valid. Half of the researchers said that they would attempt to replicate the published results first before discussing the matter publicly, and this would leave the um, questionable results in the literature during the interim. Only 43% said that they would retract the article outright, and 7% reported that they would, quote, leave the matter alone and turn to a more important research at hand. <coughs> I'll mention one last set of results. The scientists responding to the survey also perceived a reluctance at the institutional level to deal openly with scientific fraud. Researchers were asked what they, would, what they thought should happen and what they thought would happen if unequivocal evidence arose that a colleague had falsified data. Half felt that the perpetrator should be fired, but less than one-third believed that this would actually happen. Half believed that the situation would be handled internally and privately, and only 20% believed that some public reprimand or exposure would result. The responses of a few scientists indicated much less confidence and a degree of cynicism. For example, 7% felt that even in the face of unequivocal evidence, the offense would be covered up. So the picture that emerges from scientists' reports of their own behavior as well as their perceptions of the likely behavior of their collective colleagues is that there is a generalized reluctance to take prompt corrective action in response to faulty, misleading, or fraudulent data. What are some of the factors that may contribute to this reluctance? Well, there clearly are some very real pressures and concerns that come to bear on the observant scientist. Most obvious, researchers may fear that if they raise such questions or suspicions, their own reputations will be compromised and their own chances for resources and advancement will be diminished. Although there's no other systematic research on scientific fraud at present, there's a good deal of research on the behavior of innocent bystanders. For example, people who observe an accident or a theft or some other misdeed. Psychological research indicates that innocent bystanders are most likely to take action if first, they have some sense of personal responsibility. Second, if they know the appropriate form of action. Third, if they believe that their actions will be effective. And finally, if they anticipate few costs for intervening. These points, I think, are of special relevance to today's hearings. It seems to me that there are a number of steps that we might take to encourage observant scientists of the future. First, we might increase scientists' sense of personal responsibility by requiring beginning researchers to take a course in scientific ethics, a course which, among other things, would emphasize the serious implications of scientific fraud and which would communicate the notion that the individual holds a critical key to self-correction. Second, our universities or our funding institutions need to clearly delineate the appropriate form of action for individual scientists who suspect a colleague of serious misconduct, action which includes a careful consideration of the rights of, the, of those under suspicion. Third, we need to continue to improve institutional procedures for dealing promptly and effectively with scientific fraud because the actions of our institutions provide an important role model for the individual investigator. And the bottom line is, their response also determines the ultimate eff efficacy of any individual's initial action. Finally, general attitudes within the scientific community need to change so that observant scientists can feel free to responsibly raise questions and retract questionable data without fear of harmful consequences. The scientist who notices serious errors or misconduct faces a series of difficult and painful decisions. But the difficulty of those decisions is a matter of degree. The manner in which we, our institutions and we as a community respond sends a critical message to other potentially observant scientists of the future. We send messages about the likely effectiveness of intervention, and we send messages about the likely costs of intervention. In a very real sense, then, our response may encourage or inhibit self-correction in science. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to present my research findings today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Tang, and thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, while the subject matter of uh, these hearings involves scientific fraud, misconduct, and inaccuracies in the interest of time, 
I will probably be abbreviating most of the time by just using the term scientific fraud, but it will encompass all the other, the other, other two terms as well. Uh, Dr. Sprague, let me begin by asking some questions of you. Can you briefly explain the implications of Dr. Brunig's phony research for drug treatment for mentally retarded children? As I understand it, he advocated the use of Ritalin and was against the use of tranquilizing drugs. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, are Brunig's suggestions supported by the real research conducted by yourself and others? Uh, generally, the extent to which he uh, indicates the effectiveness of these medications is not. It, 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 most of it has not been replicated, but generally it's not supported. Now, for example, I would think that uh, many parents would have been terribly disappointed when their retarded children did not show dramatic improvement in IQ after being taken off tranquilizing drugs. Is that right? Well, that's certainly correct. He was saying that uh, generally when people are taking off, children are taking off tranquilizing medications, their IQ would double. And in fact, I've had experience. I've had parents come up to me after I've spoken at conferences, ask me about Bruning's research, and that was one of the most difficult things I ever had to answer was to look parents in the eyes and try to give them some reasonable answer on that knowing that the report was not in. And some children would have long-lasting tardive dyskinesia as a result of being taken off tranquilizers. Is that right? That's what he reported. Now what about Ritalin? Is it as effective for retarded children as Dr. Brunick said? I don't think it is considering that we're talking now it should be clear what people were talking about is severely behaviorally impaired and severely retarded people. The evidence isn't there at all that they're that effective, at least as what he reported, and I doubt that it is. Basically, we don't know. So he's proposing a treatment that we simply don't know about and is not supported by other work. Can you tell us a bit about what motivated you to pursue your allegations against Dr. Brunig despite all the obstacles by the universities involved and NIMH? I certainly, yes, sir, I can. It's two things. We, my wife and I kept foster infants. Some of them were retarded in our home and uh, had quite a strong, obviously, attachment to them. And then during this entire time, my wife was terminally ill and died. And her welfare, her day-to-day -day life was absolutely dependent upon medication. I would have been livid had anyone cheated on research on her medication. And I'm not implying that they did. I don't know that they did. But I would have been livid and I would have done something about it. I think every other family that has a faith on f physicians and the research behind that has the same right. And that's what has motivated me to do this. So th these, these are not just academic concerns or discussions, nor are they generally when we're involved with, uh, with the potential impact of the scientific fraud or inaccuracy. We're, we're dealing with potential impact, and it, it, it's the lives and welfare of, in this case, tens of thousands of individuals. And I think that's why I feel so strongly about it. Thank you. Dr. Jacobstein, can you tell us a bit about the specifics of the fraud involved in the case that, that you mentioned? Well, the issue started out rather different than it concluded. The initial problem was that Dr. Borer was inducing a medical student to misrepresent data in a paper, uh, in a paper that had not at this point been published or presented publicly. So there was nothing that I think we could at that point call scientific fraud. There was, however, a very serious ethical question involved about a senior, highly respected investigator uh, who was a very, who was a role model, acting as a role model for his juniors, uh, who would go about influencing medical students and other uh, subordinate investigators to do this kind of thing. And so at this point, there was, it was fairly well contained. Um, had the medical college investigated it and even had they found the charges valid, it would have been a relatively modest affair and probably could have justifiably been resolved within the institution. Uh, what happened eventually, however, was that the the uh, paper became pu was published. And at that point, incorrect and misrepresented inf information were introduced into the scientific literature. And uh, it became a much more serious problem. The research had implications for coronary artery disease, is that correct? 
That is correct. Now, what were the costs to you of pursuing your allegations in terms of time and money? Well, I, it was obviously a very time-consuming uh, effort. The best guess that I can make is perhaps 750 to 1,000 hours over the last six years. Uh, in terms of money, I would say somewhere in the range of thirteen to fifteen thousand dollars. And what happened to Dr. Borer and his colleagues as a result of the NIH investigation? Well, to the best of my knowledge, nothing has happened to Dr. Borer, uh, in spite of the fact that he was named in the report as guilty of certain misconduct. Uh, his co-authors, I also believe, nothing has happened to, and. Uh, it is my understanding that nothing was expected to happen to them since they were not named in the report. Uh, Dr. Borer was found guilty, as I gathered, of uh, sloppy record keeping, but not of intentional misrepresentation. Is that correct? That's correct. And his colleagues were not mentioned in the report. Is that right? There, the report constituted a number of parts. There, in sort of the body of the report, the comment was made that that not only Dr. Bohr, but his co-authors appeared to have been in a position to know the facts and nonetheless did not report them correctly. But in the conclusions of the uh, document uh, and in the recommendations as to action taken, the, the co-authors were not even, they were not mentioned by name and I do not believe they were even mentioned at all. Right. And Dr. Bohr is still in good standing at Cornell Medical School, is that correct? Well, I, I don't uh, have uh, a very close relationship with Cornell Medical School anymore, but it is my understanding, as far as I know, he still is. Right. And to your knowledge, did NIH criticize Cornell Medical School for their investigation? The NIH had a very mild criticism of the medical college for its initial investigation. They suggested that it was remiss in not taking it slightly more seriously. Um, but there was a much more serious problem that they overlooked entirely, and that was that during the course of this investigation, uh, the medical college, after what it called a thorough investigation, reported incorrect and false information to the NIH, which had the effect of um, making the charges seem invalid. This information was later proven to be false. And that particular uh, action by the medical college was not even commented upon directly in the report. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sprague, let me just return again and, and ask you the same uh, questions. Uh, and that is, what were the costs to you of pursuing your allegations? I haven't calculated that very well, so just guess it. Uh, I would say uh, more than a thousand hours and in, in, in terms of money I, I, I simply don't know. I've made several trips at my own expense to try to uh, gain um, further investigation of this. So I, I suppose it's a few thousand dollars. Right. And uh, in terms of the uh, validity of, of the allegations that you made, they were ac ultimately uh, found to be correct, is that correct? Correct. That's in the final report uh, that calls them deliberate and willful misconduct. Right. And uh, where is Dr. Bruning now? So far as I know, Dr. Bruning is Chief of Psychological Services at Polk Center in Polk, Pennsylvania, which is a commonwealth or state institution for the mentally retarded. Dr. Tangney, you mentioned in your testimony that your research does not really measure the prevalence of fraud. Could you explain that in a little more detail? Uh, yes. The way the question was worded and uh, the response rate to the questionnaire really, um, I think, precludes any estimate of the prevalence of scientific misconduct. Um, uh, I asked, first of all, about suspicions of misconduct, and uh, I was not clear about what constituted a suspicion. People may have had very slight suspicions. Um, so it's likely that a number of those suspicions were unfounded. It's also possible that several researchers who responded to the survey had the same individual in mind, particularly in a field where there was a recent, um, maybe well-publicized case. And finally, um, I mentioned that the response rate was somewhere in the area of 22%, a conservative estimate. 
Um, it seems unlikely that the 80% or so who did not respond um, were the same as the 20% who did. In other words, it seems to me that people who've personally struggled with the issue of scientific fraud are more likely to respond to a questionnaire of this type. And if I understood your testimony correctly, you asked scientists about fraud by asking them about their own experiences and behaviors, mm -hmm. about how they thought they would respond to hypothetical situations involving scientific misinformation. That's right. And then asking them what they think actually would happen under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, that summary correct? That's yes? correct. Okay. Uh, no matter how the questions were asked, though, the answer showed a reluctance to question other scientists' research or to admit mistakes on their own. Your research also indicates that scientists believe that fraud is not necessarily punished even when it is proven. Is that the gist of, of your uh, report? There were a fair number of respondents who had that sort of attitude. That's correct. Now, these results seem to show a real problem in dealing with fraud and misinformation. Has other research like this been done? Is that the general re report research that you were talking about, bystanders, innocent bystander kind? Um, that's right. Those studies were, uh, that's actually a fairly large body of research in social psychology, which does not pertain directly to the issue of scientific fraud. They didn't use those kinds of scenarios. But I think there are some um, close parallels between the kinds of dynamics that affect an innocent bystander uh, in the situations that they presented to subjects, such as observing a theft, um, some kind of situation that uh, pulled for a response from the innocent bystander, uh, and the kinds of situations that we're talking about here today. And I think that looking at that body of research, we can draw some possible lessons or uh, implications for what we might do in the future. Let me ask some general questions and I'll ask any of you or, or each of you to respond if you so feel. Uh, a well-known phrase in academia is publish or perish. How is that phrase relevant to today's hearing? Dr. Spring? I think it applied because there's certainly the feeling out there that if you don't publish you might perish and I might add that the, some, another phrase, grant or gradually fade. If you don't have a grant you'll gradually fade away and of course so often um, obtaining a grant depends upon voluminous <clears throat> publications, so they're really intertwined. But I think it, it's def definitely a factor. Right. Now, were, uh, were you affected at all by uh, grant approvals uh, from NIH and, uh, and, and IMH as a result of your involvement in, in this matter? I think so. After many years, uh, something like 16 years of continuous funding from NIMH, and after a unanimous of approval with a good priority score or grade in um, November of 86, I was very surprised and very unusual action. NIMH deferred funding of that particular grant. Uh, and the reasons given were decidedly unclear, at least to me. And uh, I can't, I don't know what happened beyond that. I can only have suspicions, but it was a most unusual action. In some cases where fraud or misconduct have been uncovered, the guilty scientist had an amazing number of publications, more than a dozen articles each year. Uh, is it possible to publish that many articles of high quality in your experience? I don't, I don't think it is. It, uh, <clears throat> it's very difficult to publish good articles, high quality articles, uh, to do the work and also to get them published. I don't think it's possible. I think that's one of the first signs that there's really something possibly remiss when you get those extremely high publication rates. Mr. Chairman, uh, related to that question, I would suggest that uh, possibly one of the issues involved in this case was the fact that that the quality of the papers, it's, it's a lot easier obviously to publish or to produce a lot of low quality papers than it is a lot of high quality papers. And one of the problems in this case I think is that there, that there was an attempt made to artificially elevate the appearance of quality such that many of the representations that were made tended to make what was in fact a careless, sloppy, unrigorous piece of work appear to be a very careful, thorough, and rigorous one. And um, perhaps it is possible to produce nine or ten mediocre papers a year, but I would agree 
that it is not possible to produce that number of very high quality papers. Uh, Dr. Jacobstein, Dr. Sprague, why in the instances that you've mentioned uh, do you think that the universities did not thoroughly investigate the allegations you made? I think I can give some fairly uh, pertinent information on that. If you look at the record, the uh, University of Pittsburgh is usually either number one or two in grant recipient in terms of grant monies from NIMH, uh, usually. Now, I think that puts uh, quite an onus on both NIMH and the University of Pittsburgh. It would be extremely embarrassing for them to uh, uncover all the skeletons in that closet let for the public to see since they were heavily funded by NMH and it might, might jeopardize their future funding. So I think that was a factor. You think that, that, that there was a, a, an inducement not to expose problems that, that may exist, that that in fact would be held against the institution? Is that, that your, uh, your that's, thought? That's my opinion, yes. Yeah. Dr. Jacobstein? Um, I think that there were a number of factors, uh, one, and are in general a number of factors that have to bear on this. Uh, one is the possible loss of grant money. This is, is a very serious concern, both grant money that is currently available and grant money that is hopefully going to flow in in the future. In this particular case, another issue that might potentially have influenced the medical college, although I obviously can't speak for them, was that Dr. Borer was being considered to be the recipient of an endowed chair, which obviously would have brought in a lot of money to the institution. I do not know whether that endowment would have been made in any event, uh, even, for example, if an investigation had been made and Dr. Borer was under a cloud, but I think it's apparent that that might theoretically have had an influence on their willingness to look at the issue. But in addition, I think that there are a number of personal interrelationships within an institution like that that make it very difficult for them to discipline one of their own. Uh, and aside from that, there are, with so much interrelationship in science now, it is not unusual for tainted work to rub off on associated scientists who have contributed to previous uh, similar studies with the same author. So that there is a whole intricate intertangled web of relationships where lots of people may, be, may feel threatened by the possible exposure of misconduct. And for example, even the problem of honorary authorship, many times authors who have no business being on the paper, but by virtue of their senior position, uh, might be tainted by something that they truly were innocent of, and yet they would not like this, this to come out. So I think there are many different factors preventing uh, an institutional investigation of the proper scope and quality. Before I ask my next question, let me just take note of the fact that we've been joined by a distinguished colleague from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, and I know uh, what an effort it was for you to rearrange your schedule to be with us this morning. I really do appreciate it. Um, do the three of you think, what do the three of you think about the comments of some scientists that fraud is very rare? For example, last year the editor of Science Magazine said that 99.9999% uh, of scientific articles are accurate and truthful. What research are his conclusions based on? Mr. Chairman, I think that's based upon vaporous dreams. There is, there is no evidence uh, that I know of in the literature supports that. In fact, uh, there is very little evidence on the frequency of fraud in general. We simply don't know. Dr. Jacobstein? Well, I think I would, I would agree. I, I, think that the, I think that the incidence of the extre extreme forms of fraud, the kind that Dr. Sprague was involved in, in similar forms where there is the wholesale fabrication of data, work isn't performed and is reported and so on, it's probably fairly rare, but I doubt that it approaches the one in a million of the figure you just gave. Uh, I think we also, though, have to recognize that there is a whole spectrum of fraud from minor but intentional uh, fudging of data through deliberate misrepresentation of the methodology as occurred in my case all the way out to the, the total, the, the most gross forms. Uh, so I think we have to perhaps define our, our, our terms before we can come to a, a, a more uh, general agreement on it, but I would say that of reasonable fraud, in other words, reasonable misconduct, meaning not just 
truly careless errors and excluding errors that are due to bias and things like that. I would say that fraud is not rare by any means. I would say that it is common. Um, if I had to throw out a figure, I would just guess it's saying maybe 20 to 30 percent. And if you really extend it even further to throwing out an occasional data point, which is, after all, a very minor thing, it probably extends up to the maybe 70 or 80 percent, of my, in my opinion, of scientists at one time or another have done something like that. I think the whole climate just fosters this. And there's a sense, especially toward these more minor uh, infractions, there's a sense that everybody does it. And if you don't do it, you're at a significant disadvantage. And I think that that is the problem, this general climate. Dr. Tangney? I have to say, I have not experienced that general climate. I think that out-and-out -out fraud is probably a, uh, quite a rare event, although, as uh, Dr. Sprague pointed out, we have no data to support that. Um, but I, that argument, I think, um, should not be made to uh, dismiss this as a non-significant issue. Um, even if it is relatively rare. Murder is relatively rare, yet we as a society have decided that it's important to pay pretty close attention to that kind of uh, misdeed. And I think similarly in this case, that uh, out and out faking of data, plagiarism and so forth, is very, a very serious violation of scientific ethics and warrants attention even if it is a relatively rare event. Why is there such a taboo among scientists against talking about fraud? Dr. Jacobstein? I think there are a number of reasons. I'm not sure that there's really a taboo. I think there's a great reluctance to discuss the issue, and I, or even to think about it. I think that's probably the, the, the problem. It isn't discussed because it isn't thought about it. It isn't thought about because it's repressed. The very idea of fraud is very threatening. It's threatening to sources of funding. It's threatening to relationships. Um, and it's um, very... It's very, um, I'm sorry, I, uh, I lost my, th my thread. Um, there are, there are, there is a tremendous amount of, of work involved in evaluating and correcting uh, research, research fraud from the medical school point of view, from the committee point of view. Scientists have to be appointed to committees to investigate it, and this takes an enormous amount of time. Uh, it takes a lot of time for journal editors to evaluate the pros and cons of, of articles that have been submitted to them and, and whether they should be retracted or not. There's just an enormous effort, none of which gets rewarded in a way that forwards anybody's career. And I, consequently, I think nobody wants to think about the issue. I think it's just repressed and pushed aside. Dr. Spray? I can't add much other, I guess, than an analogy. It's like uh, trying to um, handle some difficult problems in the family. And people uh, some often would just rather repress it than face alcoholism or other, other problems, drug abuse in the family. So I think that same dynamic goes on here. Dr. Tiny? Um Yeah, I think that there's a, uh, a strong element of denial because the whole issue of scientific fraud really goes against our general perception of science as a, a tireless, objective kind of pursuit of truth and that the human part of the scientist doesn't get involved in this process. Um, cases of scientific fraud underline that the human element does become involved, the passions and the failings of, of the scientist as a person. Um, that doesn't fit in with our view of science, what we've been taught since uh, grade school. So I think that there's a number of different factors that come together to make this a particularly difficult issue to, to address. Of all the concerns and suggestions that the three of you have about these issues, what one or two suggestions would you say are the most practical way for the federal government to deal with the potential problem of scientific fraud, misconduct, or inaccuracies? Dr. Spray? Mr. Chairman, I, I think there are, I'll give a couple. First, I believe, put, I strongly suggest putting deadlines on the federal agencies. In my case and others, there is simply no explanation for taking years uh, to handle these things when there are ample evidence of there's problems. Secondly, I think the, uh, the way it's currently done, the agencies are too dependent upon uh, outside reviewers although I'm not disagreeing that that's necessary, so some mechanism needs to be done where that 
uh, isn't, the agencies are not so dependent upon that. I further s would suggest that it's been a tendency to only put in-house reviewers on committees, that is, people who know the area. Clearly, people who know the area, are, it's necessary to be involved as a reviewer, but I think it would be very helpful to put a non, a person who's not an expert in that area to keep the other people honest because of the uh, complex what inter web of interrelationships that Dr. Jacobstein has been talking about. Thank you, Dr. Jacobstein. Well, I would think that the first suggestion that I would have to deal with this problem is to take it away from the research institutions themselves. As I indicated in my prepared statement and believe alluded to a moment ago, the research institutions are not capable of dealing with this problem themselves. They are not capable of doing it. Even to the extent that they had the will, they do not have the ability to do so. Secondly, I would say that from my experience and from the experience that I have learned in similar situations, the NIH is capable of providing the proper oversight the way it is constituted now. And what I would suggest is that, well, the reason is that there is just too close long-standing and often cozy relationship between the NIH and its grantee scientists and its institutions. And I would suggest that in order to have an effective mechanism of oversight, it would be required to have either a separate institution doing the oversight or at least some sort of branch within the NIH which has had a very marked degree of independence. Okay. Dr. Tangney? Um. I would simply add to that, um, again, an emphasis on education of beginning researchers in the area of, general area of scientific ethics, and also a careful look at how we, as a community, respond to these um, people who raise such allegations, to be very careful that we're not sending the message that this is a dangerous thing to do. The, uh, in, in, in thinking about the, the, this hearing, uh, it occurred to me that in a number of other professions and disciplines, there are mechanisms for uh, grievance uh, forwarding, and uh, you know, the bar, bar associations have grievance committees uh, which deal with it, and then goes beyond that. Uh, the medical uh, societies, if they don't have uh, uh, mechanisms within their own ranks, then the licensing uh, mechanisms of the states uh, deal with it. But I know of nothing within the scientific research community which goes outside of the institution itself for whom the researcher works, uh, where you'd have an objective uh, kind of a, a uh, investigation and then judgment rendered. Uh, and I have some concerns about uh, the capacity of the, of the governmental institution or even the desirability of the governmental institution to take on the full burden on its own. And I wonder if, if in your experience or if in your thinking you've thought at all about creating some kind of, of mechanism within the scientific research community, within the academic establishments, which goes beyond the individual institution to try to deal with the problem in any way at all. Dr. Sprague? Well, I've thought a lot about this, and I don't know the banking industry, but I, I feel much more comfortable with my own checking account knowing that they're bank examiners that are not, uh, that are quite independent of the particular institution where I have my money, and of course, obviously, are a governmental agency. I, I think that's a good, good model that we probably need to think about uh, creating something that's it's more independent than what we currently have so that there can be appropriate but speedy uh, conclusions to these things. They're, um, they're too important to, uh, to leave the way they're currently being handled. Dr. Tangney? I think it's important to strike a balance between um, setting up this independent uh, body that might investigate allegations of fraud, um, balancing that against um, a more general kind of regulation of science from outside of the scientific community, which I don't think is a good idea. Well, that's right, but you know, it strikes me, if somebody were to uh, uh, make a grant application for $50,000 to do a certain amount of research and then took that money and, and, and ran off on a grand vacation, uh, there'd be all kinds of criminal sanctions 
But if that same scientist uh, does the kind of thing that uh, Dr. Bruner uh, was uh, found to have done, which is in fact to uh, take money and fabricate uh, data, then uh, a different standard or no standard uh, seems to apply or very hard to bring any kind of standard to apply. And I, I share your concern, Dr. Tanya, about not having outsiders tell the scientific community what is in fact valid research and what direction to ought to go. But we're in a situation where there are not, it's not a question of having too many watchdogs or too many restrictions. We seem to have no watchdogs at all in this situation and uh, the consequences that, that have been outlined by Dr. Spray, Dr. Jacobstein, uh, indicate that in fact there can be some very serious consequences. And so that's really, it's, it's this in institutional concern that that's the basis for these hearings and I'm hopeful that out of the experience and wisdom that uh, we gain from uh, your testimony and, and the other panelists that perhaps uh, the, we'll be able to come up with some suggestions and maybe the institutions involved will be able to come up with some some harder thinking as to how to deal with the situation. Before I uh, excuse you with our gratitude, let me call on our distinguished colleague, Mr. Conyers, for whatever comment he would like to make and whatever questions he may have with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I only have one thought uh, on the Judiciary Committee, which I serve. Uh, we have a... Uh, white-collar crime bill, uh, among other things, that may criminalize uh, intentional misreporting of scientific studies. And I just wondered if you, any of you had any observations. I know the, the, the uh, ability of us to overreact, to, to create another law, another criminal law, is very intense up here. But I was just wondering if uh, that might have some uh, avenue of uh, importance in this uh, very difficult subject matter that you brought before us this morning. Well, my own opinion is that that's going too far. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think we need to make this a criminal matter in order to bring it under control. We have to devise some sort of an oversight mechanism and although of course that would be one option it seems to me there ought to be others that do not bring it into that realm. Mm -hmm. Let me see, I, I would agree with Dr. Jacobstein, I think it's going too far. I'd be very concerned about the meaning of intentional here. It, this is such a complex area that uh, I could see a great deal of difficulty of, of trying to define that appropriately so I, I think that's going too far at least at this point. Well, I, I was thinking that maybe uh, this wouldn't operate as a corrective, but I'm thinking about in the, the scope of protecting the public that uh, uh, this may not have a corrective operation, but for, for uh, this kind of activity to be going on at anywhere near a uh, level that endangers the general public, and not to ultimately be prosecutable, even though it may not be a deterrent, may be something we might want to consider. I don't think a scientist would go to the criminal statutes to find out what might happen. But nevertheless, uh, many criminal statutes are created with the idea of uh, making certain conduct unacceptable. And so in, in that, to that extent, I feel as you've expressed, that this probably wouldn't solve anything and that certainly there are a number of other things to be done. But whether we should deliberately decide not to make this a violation of our federal laws might be another question. With regard to intentional, uh, that's a very, very high standard to prove. There, there would be a lot of problems, but the problems would be resolved in favor of the person accused because it have to be uh, 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 beyond uh, be either clear or convincing evidence or beyond a reasonable doubt, which would, as you suggest, be very difficult to meet. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Conyers. Again, I want to express my appreciation to the entire panel and Dr. Jacobstein, Dr. Sprague, to commend you on the uh, very uh, commendable 
and persistent effort you undertook at great personal sacrifice in pursuing the cases that you cited in these hearings. Thank you very much, Dr. Tangy. Thank you so much. Our next panel of witnesses includes two, two scientists from the National Institutes of Health. They are Dr. Ned Fader and Mr. Walter Stewart. And uh, if you will take your positions behind two of the chairs. And before you sit down, uh, if you raise your right hand, and do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that each of the witnesses has responded in the affirmative. Let me express my appreciation to both of you for joining us today. I understand that there is one statement that will represent both of your presentations. and. Uh, if you would begin when you're ready. Uh, Dr. Fado, are you going to give the statement? Uh, with your uh, permission, Mr. Chairman, we would uh, like to share, share the presentation fine. of the Good. testimony. Uh, we are pleased to be appearing today before the House Subcommittee on Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations. My name is Ned Fader, and I am gratified that the National Institutes of Health has allowed my colleague, Walter Stewart, and uh, myself to carry out as an official duty much of the research that we report here today and has allowed us to appear here as NIH scientists. We wish to emphasize, however, that in our testimony we are presenting our own views as scientists and are not acting as spokesmen for NIH, PHS, or DHHS. The two of us are scientists who work as full-time federal employees in a laboratory at NIH. We synthesize chemical compounds that are used to study the shape of nerve cells, and we carry out basic research on the genetic control of nerve cell shape. Over the past four years, we have also conducted basic research on the difficult subjects of the accuracy of the scientific literature and of scientific misconduct. Why should anyone want to spend $5 billion on biomedical research? It is because of the extraordinary and unpredictable benefits that flow from basic research. Basic research is the study of nature, mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, and their related fields. Judged purely as an intellectual discipline, science is one of the most exciting and successful ventures of mankind. But there is an additional fe remarkable feature that is neither simple nor obvious, but has proved consistent. Discoveries in basic science have led, often in completely unexpected ways, to improvements in human health and to material benefits. We have been relieved of some of our burden of suffering, and our society is immensely richer because of discoveries in basic science. One example is basic research done years ago by Dr. Bruce Ames on the genetics of the synthesis of histidine in a bacterium. This research, widely respected at the time for its quality, appeared to have no practical value. Some 10 years later, it formed the basis of a remarkable advance, a cheap and rapid test to identify carcinogens. It is referred to as the Ames test in honor of its discoverer. This is a clear and simple example of the extraordinary practical benefits that steadily come from good basic research of no apparent practical value. Because of the deep connection between science and human progress, the U.S. government has wisely invested considerable sums in support of basic research. Science in the United States has succeeded remarkably. It is our clear impression that both scientists and non-scientists take pleasure in the success of modern American science. It is precisely because of the trust placed in scientific research that reports of scientific misconduct are deeply disturbing. Until recently, it was customary to assume that such cases of misconduct were extremely rare. However troubling each case might be, it seemed likely that the damage to science was small and that the only real damage was to the public perception of science. The cases of scientific misconduct reported in the past few years in the popular press are one reason to question the accuracy of this view. Others are studies suggesting that misconduct is not as rare as previously thought. We performed and published such a study, and despite its limitations, it is clearly relevant here. We studied the professional practices of a group of 47 scientists who were unwitting co-authors of a scientist later shown to have committed extensive acts of scientific fraud. We reached the disturbing conclusion that about a third of them had published misleading statements or had engaged in similar departures from accepted standards of scientific research. Our sample was not chosen randomly, and because of this and limitations inherent in the way we did the study, it is not possible to generalize from this figure. 
It is correct to say that neither we nor anyone else has accurate figures on the frequency of scientific misconduct. Considering the importance of the subject, this is regrettable. The scientist who cheats in his research violates the basic precept of science, which is to find the truth and make it known. A scientist who cheats injures other scientists by misleading them, and he injures the public by wasting their money and sometimes by falsely claiming discoveries that directly affect the public health and welfare. Similar damage can be done by the scientist who, through irresponsibility or carelessness, publishes erroneous research or fails to correct it. Finally, there is the monetary cost of junk research that is known at the time it is done to be of little or no value. And uh, I will turn over the rest of the testimony to my colleague, Walter Stewart. Science has reliable and time-tested methods for dealing with error. These include replication and peer review. These mechanisms, however, were not designed to detect or correct deliberate misrepresentation. Indeed, conventional science has hardly considered this problem so that individual cases have been handled with improvised methods. Often these methods have failed disastrously. We describe in our written testimony three cases we studied in which aspects of the system did not work well, but in the interest of saving time, we will discuss just one today. We consider the case brought to light by Dr. Robert Sprague, from whom the committee has already heard. In late 1983, he wrote a letter to NIMH describing in detail his evidence and conclusion that his associate, Dr. Stephen Bruning, had committed extensive scientific fraud in NIMH-supported research on the drug therapy of mental retardation. Eventually, Dr. Sprague's allegations proved entirely valid. Indeed, the final committee report added surprisingly little to the evidence that he had already provided more than three years before. What is disturbing is that it required three and one-half years of intense work on Dr. Sprague's part, pressuring NIMH directly and through Congress and the press before NIMH completed its thorough but unduly prolonged investigation and made its findings public. During this period, patients were exposed unnecessarily to questionable treatment advocated by Bruning on the basis of his fabricated research. The drugs involved in Bruning's research often have serious side effects. Mr. Chairman, this is a graphic and compelling illustration of the direct danger to the public posed by fraudulent research. A disturbing point, and one that is not well known, was the chronic and growing friction between Dr. Sprague and NIMH as NIMH proceeded slowly to public disclosure of the problem. We note here that when Dr. Sprague requested continuing support for his research from NIMH, his request was unanimously approved by a panel of his peers. Nonetheless, NIMH deferred approval of his request for further support and by its action left him without NIMH funding for the first time in 17 years. Ultimately, after an outcry in the press, NIMH re-reviewed his proposal and reinstated his funding at a considerably reduced level for a period of one year in order to allow him to wind down his research. The inadequate institutional performance contrasts with Dr. Sprague's persistent and principled conduct. We wish to draw attention to the fact that Dr. Sprague was a principal investigator on the grant used by Bruning. He had supervisory responsibility for Bruning's actions and therefore for his fraud. By drawing attention to the fraudulent actions of a close colleague working on his own grant, Dr. Sprague was necessarily exposing his own actions to minute scrutiny, which is in fact what occurred. Clearly, Mr. Chairman, the actions taken by Dr. Sprague required integrity and unusual courage. He served the public well. The cases we study, and I'm on page eight, the cases we study have often been chosen because they appear to, to us important. They represent a small fraction of all cases of alleged misconduct, and they are not a random sample, and they may not be representative. Despite the limitations of our experience, we offer below some observation based on our studies. One of the patterns in the cases we have studied is that scientists alleging misconduct are often treated poorly. They have been subjected to criticism and to personal and professional retaliation, even in cases where their allegations have ultimately proved valid. There seems little doubt that the unfavorable reception affects scientists' willingness to report misconduct. We have talked with considerably more than 20 scientists who have alleged misconduct to us privately, but have been reluctant to make their allegations through NIH or institutional channels. Their reluctance strongly suggests to us that the reported cases of misconduct represent only a small fraction of the total. Some have told us that their reluctance is due to fear of the professional consequences. Another reason often given is the belief that no effective action will result. 
We do not assert that either of these beliefs is always correct. We do think, however, that these beliefs are common and that they represent and that they reflect a lack of confidence by many scientists about the efficacy of the current systems. Because of the unjustified harm that has sometimes occurred to those alleging misconduct, it is understandable that consideration should be given to the use of anonymous allegations. Indeed, NIH rules currently allow them. Though this rule is a commendable attempt to protect those alleging misconduct, we feel that the use of anonymous allegations runs counter to the scientific tradition of free and open debate. It may well encourage unwarranted allegations as well. It is a matter of considerable satisfaction that Dr. Sprague and Dr. Jacobstein, both of whom are here today, have taken direct personal responsibility for every allegation they made. We suggest that the use of anonymous allegations may endanger the fabric of trust between scientists. When we have seen failures in investigations, they have often involved one or more of the following four problems. Secrecy, lack of experience in investigations, a conflict of interest, and a lack of speed. Here is an example. Certain investigations of alleged misrepresentation have not even included an inspection of the underlying data on which the question publication was based. Secrecy is sometimes said to be necessary to protect the reputations of the accuser or of those unjustly accused. We question this argument. Rumors travel quickly and can have profound effects. It is our impression that the present system for resolving allegations is sometimes a fair, unfair to the accused, the accuser, and the public. The importance of expertise in the particular field of science in which the allegation was made has been, in our opinion, overstated by many. In our experience, many allegations can be technically evaluated without special confidence in the field. Furthermore, those outside the field are less likely to have a conflict of interest. It is our opinion that such conflicts affect the outcome of investigations far more often than is generally realized. Systems for dealing with allegations of scientific misconduct are relatively new and will undoubtedly change and improve in the future. What directions should these changes take? This is a difficult question to which we have no guaranteed solution. Certain approaches, however, clearly carry a great risk of doing more harm than good. Among them are direct regulation or policing of scientific research by authorities outside of science. Research is a difficult, intricate, and important enterprise. The complex fabric of collegial interaction which depends on trust is necessary for scientific progress and is easily damaged. Great caution should be taken not to implement measures that will weaken instead of strengthen science. We conclude with several suggestions which we have, which I won't read in the interest of uh, speed here, Mr. Chairman, but they have in common the feature that they try to implement the things in science which are already there. In other words, they are, are an attempt to embody scientific principles and strengthen them rather than impose another system of regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stewart and Dr. Fader. Uh, how many allegations of scientific fraud, misconduct, or inaccuracies do you hear about every year? I would say we hear of approximately 100 allegations a year. And how many of these are investigated by you or HHS? Very few by either, perhaps five a year. Why aren't more investigated? Uh, in our case, it's limitations of time. In the case of NIH, uh, very, m most of these allegations are not brought to NIH and they do not have the opportunity to investigate them. Some are of older misconduct which would be harder to investigate. How much of your time is spent in investigating fraud, misconduct, or inaccuracies? We are restricted in our uh, job descriptions to 20% of our professional time. Now, have your job descriptions changed over time? Yes, uh, there was a point at which uh, 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 scientific misconduct was not included in our job descriptions. Uh, it was placed in, and then sometime after that, the 20% restriction was added. How long were you doing it without restrictions at all at the time? My memory is that it was about a year that we were doing it without restrictions. And when were the restrictions placed on you, the 20% restriction? They were placed to my memory about a year and a half ago. <coughs> and what kind of fraud issues were you working on when your job description changed? We had recently uh, uh, completed the first phase of a study of an important paper in molecular biology which was asserted to be wrong and had prepared a manuscript summarizing our findings. Uh, you had mentioned a number of cases in your written testimony, but you only cited 
one of those. I'm going to ask you about uh, a second one. Uh, tell us some more about the case involving Dr. DeLuca at the University of Wisconsin. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is a case uh, arising out of litigation between two private parties, WARP, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, and RIMAC, which is a small Cambridge-based research institute. We are affiliated with neither and know none of, none of the parties. We were contacted approximately a year ago, a little more than a year ago, and asked if we would be willing to serve as expert witnesses in the case. We agreed and served in our private rather than our official capacity. Uh, we didn't accept compensation uh, for our work and did it on our annual leave. The matter in contention is extremely complex and involves difficult questions of fact. It is made more difficult by the passage of time. Many of the actions that are relevant occurred some 15 years ago. It involved a questioned synthesis of an important, medically important vitamin D derivative, 1-alpha-hydroxy cholecalciferol. The work was done by Dr. Hector DeLuca, Dr. Schnoes, and two associates at the University of Wisconsin. It was patent, and the patent rights were uh, given by NIH to them and subsequently to WARF. That summary of the transfer of rights may not be ex entirely accurate, but it gives the sense. The RIMAC, which was the plaintiff in the case, uh, asserted eventually that the patents were based on research that w was not merely faulty, it actually involved fraud. And we uh, examined over a period of several months, in great detail, we examined the voluminous evidence that had been developed in the case. And what were your conclusions? We concluded that there was extremely solid evidence of scientific misrepresentation in the published literature, and that there was similarly strong evidence that there had been an elaborate cover-up over a period of many years. We concluded that it was also, our professional in our professional opinions, extremely likely that at least some of the inventors of the patent knew at the time they submitted the patent that the synthesis did not work and that, in fact, it was based on fraudulent work. And was this patent valuable in any way? Was there a, a valuable utilization made of it? It is my understanding that it has proved valuable and that it has earned sums of money uh, well in excess of a million dollars. And uh, what was the, uh, the attitude of the University of Wisconsin in regard to this matter? I can't characterize that completely, but I can state some facts that I do know. The University of Wisconsin did not initiate an investigation of misconduct during the course of the litigation, and this, of course, may have been out of an uh, attempt on their part not to interfere with the judicial process. Uh, the case was settled in June. Uh, during the nine months that occurred afterwards, they did not initiate an investigation. And in fact, their announcement of the investigation was only a few days before the matter appeared in a, uh, the Isthmus, which is a uh, newspaper in Madison, Wisconsin. And so, again, what we have here is potentially, at least, a conflict of interest uh, between the university's role in making sure that the scientific work done uh, is in fact one of quality and integrity and its own uh, uh, scientific, its own uh, economic uh, benefits. The, the University of Wisconsin was a partner in the, uh, in the patent rights, is that correct? I believe they were not technically a partner, but that they receive every year uh, very substantial sums of money from Wharf so that I think they did have a very direct financial stake and without any imputation of wrongdoing on their part, I think it's clear that they had a very strong conflict of interest between the commercial interests that were being litigated on their doorstep and their academic responsibilities as an institution. And I might add that we may see more of this in the future as science, because of the great breakthroughs that have been made, science is scrambling now to uh, make arrangements in all sorts of ways so to finance new research out of the uh, uh, proceeds from old research. And the question of a commercial conflict may become more important in the future. Right. Uh, you've you referred now to uh, 
an acronym, WARF. What is that? Excuse me, WARF uh, stands for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, which is a uh, old and very distinguished organization of a almost unique sort. It's a patent holding organization for the University of Wisconsin. And they initially obtained patents on vitamin D on research done, I guess, by Dr. Steenbrook. The name may be wrong, but they, they have uh, over the years provided large sums of money to the university and have been active in patenting work and funding work done at the university. There was an article uh, on the New England, in the New England Journal of Medicine, I believe, on WARF, which summarized uh, some of their achievements and also pointed out some of the problems inherent in the commercial activities occurring on a university's uh, doorstep. Would you say that this case points out the problems inherent in expecting universities to investigate allegations against their own faculty members, especially against well-respected faculty members that lend prestige to the university and may also be a financial asset to the university? Yes, I would agree with that. Is it necessary, I think you commented on this in your testimony, but let me get it again for the record. Is it necessary to be an expert on the science involved in each allegation for each individual case of alleged fraud or misconduct? In our experience, frequently it is not. I would say it is important always to have access to technical expertise, but I think the idea of constituting a panel exclusively of people who are experts in the field has the danger of the conflicts that we've heard so much about this morning, and I think justifiably so. Uh, tell me, how did you get into your line of work at NIH to begin with? How did that happen? You weren't. You, were, you weren't hired to do the work that you're doing in, in uh, scientific investigation, is that right? That is correct. How did, how did that occur? Uh, well, Dr. Fader? Well, we, uh, we'd always had uh, a sort of a passing interest in the subject of misconduct and wondered about it a little. And as Harvard alumni, we got a copy of the Ross Report, which is a part of our written but not our spoken uh, testimony. And uh, we read it, and simply by reading it, we recognized it was grossly defective. Tried to do something about it, uh, accomplished nothing. But this kindled our interest in the Darcy case, and that led step by step to uh, 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 increasing work on our part on the subject of scientific misconduct. And I think what you've testified to is that uh, initially the NIH was uh, extremely supportive of your efforts and allowed you to have unlimited use of your time in doing this kind of inquiry into scientific fraud. Is that right? Well, I think that it's correct to say, uh, it would be more correct to say that after uh, a period of uh, about nine months, the NIH permitted us to uh, continue working on this as an official duty. Right. And then, the, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could correct yes. I think we were given a complete latitude and a great deal of support before they knew we were working on this. It's not customary to inform uh, uh, people about what you're working on and the problems th there was a problem when they found out what we were working on in the normal course of events and they hadn't anticipated uh, that anyone would work on such a topic because it is in fact unusual I'm, I'm not sure that I understand that uh, 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 Dr. Fader's answer uh, what I think he was saying is that there's been a cycling of, of positions no uh, th there hasn't been one position that's lasted very long in terms Though we have been able to work on it often, it's been under different uh, arrangements. So while well, they allowed you to use unlimited amounts of your time after you demonstrated that you were good at doing this kind of work, but on only because, or to some extent because, they didn't know what it was that you were working on specifically. Is that what you're saying? Uh, the, the period during which we found it easiest to work on it was the period before they knew we were working on it. And that's the period where we had unlimited time. Right. Um, in a memorandum dated February 17, 1988, regarding an investigation of alleged scientific misconduct, you state that an advisory panel of outside experts has been appointed by NIH for that investigation. Uh, since this investigation is not completed, I won't mention the names of those involved. However, according to your memo, at least two of the three scientists on the advisory panel had close ties with one of the scientists that is being investigated. You expressed concern about this apparent conflict of interest, in the, and in, in their response, the NIH officials 
in essence stated that it is up to the conscience of each person asked to decide whether they have a conflict of interest. Do you agree with that statement? Well, I'm strongly in favor of conscience, but I think it might be useful to impose other standards as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I gather that in that particular case now, at least as to uh, one aspect of that conflict, as to two of those people, that's been, that's been corrected as of today or yesterday. Is that, is that your understanding? My understanding is that the correction has been taking place over the last week or so at least. Right. Uh, let me talk about the issue of conflict of interest more generally as it would apply to any case. Uh, usually we think of a conflict of interest as of financial benefits. For example, I'd expect that co-authors of a major scientific textbook will make a profit if at least one of the authors has an excellent reputation, but there would be considerably less profit from the exact same book if one of the authors is found to be guilty of fraud or misconduct. Is that right? I would assume so. So if a scientist is participating in an investigation of another scientist, either at a university or for NIH, it would be a financial conflict of interest if the investigator and the person being investigated were co-authors of a textbook. Is that correct? I would think so myself. Now, in science, there may be other non-financial interests that conflict in an investigation of a colleague. For example, if a scientist is the former student of a well-known scientist or co-authors articles with a well-known scientist. What are the benefits of that arrangement? Does that lend prestige to the less well-known scientist? Yes, and scientists are frequently known uh, by, the person by the person or persons with whom they've worked, especially if they're famous. Does it affect job opportunities for the less well-known co-author or former student? It's my understanding that it often does. So if a scientist is well known, that is of great benefit to their former students and co-authors, and if a scientist's reputation is questioned, their colleagues may also fall from favor. Is that correct? I would think that's quite possible. Now, on the first panel this morning, we heard how badly academic whistleblowers are sometimes treated. Are those stories consistent with what you have heard from other academic whistleblowers? Yes, there's unfortunately a very consistent pattern. Now, I'd like to ask you about your own experience as whistleblowers. Mr. I Chairman, I might ask, we've gone to a great deal of trouble not to, uh, uh, in any way we could, uh, uh, complain about or uh, discuss our own situation. And I would just like to ask that insofar as that's possible and consistent with your goals today, uh, if it is possible, we'd like to request that. Uh, supposing I ask you some specific factual questions and you tell me whether in fact that did or did not occur. Is of that course. All right? okay. Of course. Uh, we have a memo uh, which was written by you to Dr. Jesse Roth, the director of the institute where you work on October 10 of 1985. Uh, you state that on October 9, one of, your, were, one of you were informed that everything that you had stored in room 407 was being trucked away and that if you wanted to save any of it, you should act quickly. You state that you were astonished to hear this since you had previously been told that when it came time to empty that room, the equipment would be left in the hallway. You went immediately to room 407 and found that almost all the equipment had been removed. You say, and I'm quoting now, we ran down to the loading platform and found that the movers and the moving truck were gone, close quote. You then, quote, raced to surplus and located some of the equipment, close quote, but were told that much of it had been taken to the salvage yard. You then ran to the salvage yard where you climbed into a dumpster in an effort to save your equipment, but found that most of your equipment was broken or unreachable. And this refers to research and scientific work that you were doing on behalf of uh, NIH. Is that correct? Yes, that is. And the summary that I've given you is an accurate summary. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And in essence, what you were saying was that your laboratory equipment was moved and destroyed without your approval. Is that right? That's right. A year later, on October 31st of 1986, 
Uh, you wrote a memorandum to Dr. Roth regarding your research resources. In this memo, you described the loss of technical staff and state that you had been reassigned twice to successively smaller laboratories and there is no longer even room for a desk. You also state that much of your scientific equipment had been given to other labs and you were forbidden to use it even when not in use by other scientists. You give details of these problems and ask point blank whether they are related to your investigation of fraud and misconduct. Uh, did you ever receive a response to that question? No, we never received a response. Uh, so it, it, it would seem to me, and again, I don't ask you to, to comment on this, but it uh, would seem to me by review of these facts uh, that, in fact, uh, you fell, the two of you fell from favor very quickly with an NIH when it appeared that, in fact, your, your investigation of fraud and misconduct uh, was focused on some people who had apparently a great deal of prestige within the scientific community. Uh, and I won't ask you to comment on that, but that's the way it appears to me from, from recitation of, uh, of, this, uh, of the facts. Have your performance evaluations always been satisfactory within the agency? No, uh, not over the last few years. Would you like to expand on that? When did they stop being uh, uh, satisfactory? The facts in, in the case are so complicated that it would be hard for me to give a detailed summary, but there have been a number, Dr. Fader uh, rates my performance and he's always rated it as satisfactory, for which of course I'm very grateful. Uh, Dr. Fader's supervisor rates his performance, and that's where the problem is. After we had started our, oh, Dr. Fader's performance had been always uh, judged uh, satisfactory, as I understand it, over a period of many, many, many years. And after we began our work on scientific misconduct, uh, the performance ratings began to be questioned, and there were a number of instances. In every case, we've appealed, and uh, sometimes three or four levels deep. And eventually, I believe every single one of the actions that was taken has been at some level reversed or postponed. So that uh, the, the record is eventually clear, but unfortunately, writing all of these memoranda, which probably run to the dozens, has taken us a great deal of time and taken us away from both our scientific lab work and from our work on scientific misconduct. Right. Uh, you've indicated that you have had sort of an informal status at NIH as investigators into areas of misconduct. Uh, is there a formal structure within NIH for investigating allegations of fraud and misconduct and inaccuracies? There is an office that receives such complaints. And uh, what is the, uh, the staffing of that office? My understanding, which could be wrong, is that it's headed by Ms. Mary Myers and that there are two people who work there in the capacity of approximately administrative assistants or secretaries. And that could be wrong, that's just my own belief. Right. And, uh, uh, well, I'll ask the other the questions of the, of the uh, next panel. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Conyer, let me call on you for questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think you covered uh, all of these questions in a very good way. I want to commend the witnesses. Do you have recommendations you would leave with this subcommittee as to what we, what NIH could do to prevent scientific fraud and misconduct? It's a very complex question, uh, sir, and I don't know if there are going to be any easy answers. Uh, we are uh, incurable optimists, and we think that the system uh, can be made better, and it will probably be made better, but we uh, just as the previous panel had some reservations about uh, the criminal side of the thing, we, we almost, I would almost go in the other direction. I think one of the things that inhibits people from simply correcting errors, I'm now backing off the question of scientific fraud and just addressing the question of scientific error, is the possibility that they may be judged to have engaged in misconduct in some way. And one of the wonderful things that Dr. Sprague did was he invited a minute examination of his own conduct, and most of us wouldn't want to do that. And I think the, one of the problems with uh, addressing this via the criminal system is simply that it w might increase the level of fear. We see fear 
present in many scientists and we wish that the scientific community were largely free of fear. And I think if we could encourage more openness, and I think NIH might take a leading role in that, and if wherever possible, if investigations of scientific error or scientific misconduct were done openly, that might make things easier. And the other thing, I think if we as scientists recognize that error is just simply intrinsic, inevitable in the process of making new discoveries, I think that would ease the problem. Well, Dr. Fader, do you believe that uh, if we had a, a much larger department working in the areas that both of you are working on, wouldn't that help things immensely? Just by increasing your numbers? Uh, I think size alone is certainly not the answer, although it, it might be helpful. I think, I think at least as important might be uh, just a, a, a clearer recognition of the problem, which at the present time is poorly understood. Well, if it was still just you two instead of four like you, it would seem to me the more we understand the problem, the, the more faders and stewards uh, we would need at uh, NIH. Well, we certainly like to have some company there. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I can understand your reluctance to want to criminalize this conduct, and uh, we certainly don't want scientists working around America in fear. But we have a whole body of uh, criminal laws in America that are designed to protect the public, not to, not to determine whether the person that may be violating this particular act that is considered offensive is in fear or not. Uh, we've been engaged in a discussion about incredible harm and injury that could be visited upon the general public as a result of some of these misrepresentations. And yet everyone uh, says, but let's not criminalize this conduct. Uh, seems to me that somewhere along the line in the, uh, in the, in the scope of, uh, of uh, operating for the public policy, I'm, I'm not sure how long the federal government can continue to say uh, these are awful things. Uh, incredible numbers of people may be injured, but we don't want to scare scientists. So for goodness sakes, let's, let's not make this against the law. I mean, we were, it's horrible. And I, I, uh, I, I sort of resist that. I don't know why I'm sitting here saying, uh, why are scientists in a different position from anybody else that operates against the public interest? Your point is an excellent one, sir, and uh, makes me squirm. Uh, we've, it's a very good point. I could advance two, since you didn't buy the first argument from fear, I might uh, try two others. One is uh, the, simply that we have seen and we participated in addressing a question of scientific fact simply in a legal setting, not a criminal one, but a civil one. And it's astonishing how tricky lawyers are. And we found that a problem that a scientist would just say, well, that's nonsense, or perhaps even use an expletive, would uh, require pages and pages and pages of legal uh, uh, reasoning. So one thing is the complexity. The second is speaking a little bit out of school, but my wife is a prosecutor. I'm very proud of the work she does for the federal government in terms of rounding up people who have uh, cheated on in voting. But it's also such a, a complicated business. And science is itself complicated, and the factual patterns are so complicated. I hope perhaps that scientists uh, uh, seeing the possibility of danger and seeing the public concern, which I think is entirely justified, will uh, uh, paddle even quicker towards solving these problems themselves before somebody else solves them for them. Well, that's the whole idea of criminal law, deterrent. <laughs> Good point. All right, thank you very much. I, I've enjoyed your testimony. I think it's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Conyers. And, and again, I think that uh, uh, to underscore Mr. Conyers' position, if you have situations such as the one that, that Dr. Sprague uh, brought to light, where clearly you, it, it's not a, not a matter of, of, of judgment as to whether this was an honest error or an inadvertent inaccuracy, but where you have a situation where there was a deliberate, uh, admitted falsification of, uh, of facts, of data, 
where you could demonstrate objectively, as Dr. Sprague did, that there were more days of clinical work being represented than existed in that particular calendar year. It seems to me that what you've got, in essence, is the equivalent of somebody forging a check or forging anything else or committing perjury or, or whatever. I mean, it, it is a clear, willful, deliberate, uh, wrongful act. Now, would you feel the same way in that kind of situation as in those instances where you have a possibility of, uh, of errors of judgment? Mr. Chairman, I agree. I think it's uh, even a worse act because unlike forging a check which only affects bank balances and commercial interests, these actions have a possible effect on the public safety and I think they're e extraordinarily serious. I think all we are pleading is, uh, as I suppose all interests plead, that their own group is specially sensitive. I think that in fact science is an unusually delicate venture and perhaps unusually susceptible to harm by uh, rigid outside uh, control. Right, the, but as, as I indicated to the first panel, the, the problem is that there apparently has not been a demonstrated will up to this point in any event uh, on the part of the institutions involved, whether it be the federal government research granting institutions or the universities, which are the grantees in, uh, in essence, uh, or the societies which deal with the individual scientists and have their associations, no effort at all or will, it, or will to create a mechanism which would demonstrate that, okay, you don't have to get the federal government involved in this because we're in fact making sure that our house is clean. Uh, and I think what Mr. Conyers is saying, and I think his point is extremely well taken, is that you can't have it both ways. You, you can't have a continuation of the kind of flagrant abuses that have been spoken about here today and others which uh, have not been spoken about here today and uh, say that, well, there's nobody who's to hold the people who are the wrongdoers accountable because in some way that would damage the morale of the people who are in the field of wrongdoing. Thank you very, very much. I, very important uh, testimony and again, uh, my respect and admiration to the two of you for working under very difficult circumstances. And it would seem to me, and this applies uh, to agencies at all levels of government uh, and perhaps even to some non-governmental agencies, it always amazes me that institutions, rather than cherishing people within their ranks who should make them proud of the work that they are doing, in fact, uh, not only diminish, but in some instances, in your, you've given some instance in your, your, your cases, have attempted to uh, destroy the effectiveness of people like yourselves. I think that that's wrong, and I would like to think that uh, the NIH would think better of that kind of uh, course of conduct. May I Mr. Conyers, please. To the witnesses too, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, may I ask you, Mr. Please. Chairman, if, if NIH uh, plans to testify before the subcommittee, these witnesses came in their indivi individual capacity. Yes, the next panel, in fact, we Thank will you. have some NIH people. Thank you both Thank very, you. very much. We now leave this live hearing to fulfill our commitment to bring you live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the House of Representatives. For information about whether this program will re-air in its entirety in our overnight schedule, tune into our schedule update at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 Pacific. Major events that air on C-SPAN are previewed in the C-SPAN update, the network's weekly newspaper.